welcome to the First United Methodist Church online worship service. Today's service is performed by Pastor Aaron Ackney. Now here is today's service.
today and stand with your bulletin. We are going to, our call to worship is between song and word, so if you will follow your bulletin. Our first, we will sing from our insert, the advent of our God. Today begins the third week of Advent. We are traveling in anticipation the days before Christmas. The world was changed on that first Christmas, and yet most in the world were clueless. Many in the world today still remain clueless, but we are not finding them. The babe of Bethlehem is our focus. His name is Jesus the Christ. Our hearts and lives have been changed by him, and that has brought us to great inside our soul. It is an internal state, not depending on anything external. The world cannot give us true joy, nor can the world take our joy away. The angels announce the birth of Christ, claiming, I bring you the news of great joy. To you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. No Christ, no hope. No Christ, no hope. No Christ, no peace. No Christ, no peace. No Christ, no joy. No Christ, no joy. Faith and hope. Our faith 
The second candle was for peace. Today, we light the candle of joy. Jesus wants us to have his joy in us. that you give us special motivation to respond to their call to forsake any word, thought, or deed that would keep us from your salvation. We are faithfully waiting to celebrate with joy the nativity of Christ the Savior, and we are watching in hope of his glorious return to usher us into his glory, where we will live with you forevermore. Amen. Our call to giving today is Jeremiah 22, 16. They saw to it that justice and help were given the poor and the needy, and all went well for them. This is how people live close to God. I am not married, although I am a woman. And I do remember being a teenager. Mary was a young teen, and God asked her to bear his son. Who would become our Savior, Christ the Lord. And the song I am singing is perhaps a prayer, perhaps some of the multitude of thoughts Mary may have had as she was preparing to deliver her child, Jesus Christ, Son of God.
to give back in one of these ways to honor you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading today are selected verses from Ruth 3, 1 through 18. <coughs> Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman Boaz, who's, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me, I will do. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and there lying at his feet was a woman. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your cloak over your servant, for you are next of kin. He said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This last instance of your loyalty is better than the first. You have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. For all the assembly of my people know that you are a worthy woman. But now, though it is true that I am a near kinsman, there is another kinsman more closely related than I. Remain this night, and in the morning, 
If he will act as next of kin for you, good, let him do it. If he is not willing to act as next of kin for you, then as the Lord lives, I will act as next of kin for you. Lie down until the morning. May God bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. Especially in this time of the year, as we concentrate on hope and peace and joy and love, and how those change our lives, that when we live that way, Lord, we would be different from the rest of the world. How desperate the world is for hope and peace and joy and love. So as we go through this season, Lord, may, may you use each one of us to help change the world around us as we live according to the faith which is ours. We would lift to you 
people and concerns that we have about situations and families and loved ones and friends. We have already named several people out loud. We have listed a number in the bulletin and then Lord we, we each know of some in our own hearts that we would name right now before you. And we're humbled and yet we're thrilled to hold on to the truth of faith that says that you hear and answer each one of our prayers. And so for your divine attention into each of these lives and circumstances, we would be faithful to give you thanks and praise. And as we come before you, Lord, we would also not just unite our hearts, but we would unite our voices, closing this prayer with the words your son taught us when he said, when you pray, pray like this, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For mine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And now I offer our traditional prayer. Lord, as we come to this moment in our worship today, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, you would speak to us and our lives would be changed. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So we've been studying the book of Ruth during this Advent season and using it as a prequel story to the Christmas story. And so far we've spoken about faith and hope and peace, chapters 1 and 2. We're going to conclude this week and next week with chapters 3 and 4, talking about joy and love. Remember, hope, peace, joy, and love were all lost to Naomi and Ruth when they were in Moab. But there was a tiny seed of faith that remained in Naomi. And through that, we saw that hope and peace were restored in chapters 1 and 2. And so now, in chapters 3 and 4, we will follow the progression and see how love and joy were also regained by them. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, serve as probably the hinge or the pivotal point in the whole story. Now, there are two understandings about Israelite culture that become important for us to be able to grasp the full impact of chapter 3. The first of those is the kinsman redeemer law. There are several places where this law is stated in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy is one of them. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother be the near kinsman shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her, and the first son she bears shall carry the name of the dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. 
However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the gate. Her family gets redeemed by the near kinsmen. There are other places where that is spoken about. Now, over the years, there have been a number of people and scholars who have been critical of the book of Ruth, even questioning whether it should be included in the Bible and the Holy Scriptures. I believe these verses in chapter 3 that we're talking about right now are the precise place where this book shines bright in the Bible. Why? Because this is the only example in the Old Testament of a near kinsman redeemer at work. Boaz, I'm talking about. The only opportunity to realize a new life that the near kinsman redeemer brings. That's what makes this a great prequel to the event of the birth of Jesus Christ, who was the redeemer of the world, born in Bethlehem. Now, in the Old Testament, the word atonement is used with sin. And the atonement denotes a covering over of the sins. It's associated with the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. In the New Testament, the word redemption is used. Redemption is the paying of a price so that the redeemed is set free from sin. They are no longer slaves to sin. So I want us to be mindful this Advent season that Bethlehem is the only place in the Bible associated with a Redeemer, which is why we journey to Bethlehem every Advent season. The second feature is the threshing floor. We need to know about the threshing floor in order to understand this chapter. As we use the word floor today, we think of a building, floors of buildings. Not so in this story. Threshing in the Bible depends upon the wind. Of course that's not true today. We have sophisticated combine machinery that does our threshing. I was in one of those machines just a couple weeks ago. Here's a helpful fact. In the Bible times, to take advantage of the wind, a threshing floor was normally outside on top of a hill or a knoll, where clay soil was packed down so tightly that nothing could grow there, usually in the shape of a circle. The sheaves of grain would be brought and stacked in late afternoons when the wind started to blow. They would be brought and used to use the wind power. That usually started in the afternoon and would continue into the evening, the wind. The sheaves would be spread out on the clay floor. The oxen and the donkeys with wooden sleds would rumble over the sheaves and separate, knock off the heads of grain, and then the grain was scooped up and flailed into the air at the edge of the circle from which the wind was blowing. And the heavier grain would fall closest to the flail, and the chaff would blow away further. Thus it would be separated, the wheat from the chaff. The grain was gathered and piled up. 
and that process continued as long as the wind was sufficient to separate the wheat and the chaff, sometimes well into the night, each night being different depending upon how the wind was blowing. And when the threshing was over for that night, there was a meal of Thanksgiving, and then the owner and the workers would literally sleep at that spot to protect the harvest. The heart of chapter 3 takes place at that spot on the threshing floor. Now let's talk about a time frame between chapters 2 and chapter 3 in Ruth. It could be four weeks, five weeks, could be as many as eight weeks, depending upon the weather and how the harvest was proceeding. And all during those weeks, what we need to keep in mind is that the relationship between Ruth and Boaz was growing every day. Now, Ruth knows. Once she went back to Naomi and told her whose field he was at, Ruth now knows who Boaz is. In chapter 3, Naomi is sensing some kind of calling. Perhaps God's spirit in her, perhaps some feelings of responsibility toward her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Remember, before they returned from Moab to Bethlehem, Ruth's prayer for her daughter's-in-law was, we read it in chapter 1, verse 9, May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Orpah, of course, went back to her family to make that true. But Ruth stayed with Naomi. And now Naomi is working toward fulfilling this prayer through Boaz. Ruth was maybe going a little more slowly than what Naomi was thinking she needed to. And so Naomi's now playing matchmaker. We're all familiar with how that works. And it was definitely part of a parent's role in Bible time. Hope had opened up thoughts of the future in Naomi. And so she's now introducing a plan to Ruth for pressing Boaz to redeem Ruth using another prayerful blessing here in chapter 3. My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you that you will be provided for. Now Naomi and Ruth have received gifts of food and kindness from Boaz. But Naomi pushes Ruth to enter into an even deeper relationship with the giver of those gifts. And I draw that to our attention during this season because that's a great lesson for us at Christmas time in particular when there's so much gift giving. We all enjoy receiving gifts. But really what we need to be doing is seeking interaction with the giver of the gifts. Way more so than just enjoying the gifts that we receive. So Naomi is preparing Ruth to take this relationship with Boaz to a new level. There's an interesting and intriguing alignment between what Ruth does to become the bride of Boaz and what happens to us when we are redeemed by Christ and become his bride. Let's look at this. First, Ruth bathed. 
or was made clean. And that did not happen then as it does now. It was literally not as easy as we enjoy it. But as the bride of Christ, we are made clean. In fact, we're made spotless without a blemish and righteous. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. When we are redeemed, our sins are washed away. Secondly, Ruth anointed herself with oil. Now culturally, at the time, everyone was living and working in dirt and associating with animals. Lots of times, even in your own home. And given the lack of deodorants, or the ability to change clothes, or running water, or shampoos and soaps for daily bathing, oil became the method of making the human body more appealing. And we're told that when we are redeemed, we also are anointed. John writes to the early church in his letter and says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has been taught you, so remain in him. And how does the Holy Spirit anoint us and make us more appealing? By the gifts of the Spirit in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Thirdly, Ruth put on new clothes. Now, no one needs to be told what a difference that can make. And when we are redeemed, the scriptures say we are clothed with the white robe of righteousness, adorned in beauty for our bridegroom, the Lamb, the Lord. Revelation 19. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, that's us, has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen are the righteous deeds of the saints. And then fourthly, Ruth was also careful how to present herself to Boaz at the right time, in the right place, so that he would receive her and respond to her. As the bride of Christ, we come to the Father through the Son, who is also our great high priest. The writer to the Hebrew church said, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness. We just did that a few minutes ago. So that we may receive mercy and find grace in our times of need. What a blessing that is to us. Because we are his bride, through Christ, we can boldly approach the Father any time, and he receives us. 
That's the whole point of the curtain being torn in two when Christ was crucified. There's no longer a separating barrier. So Ruth goes to the threshing floor, prepared to follow Naomi's instructions. And when Boaz falls asleep on the grain, Ruth lays down on the ground by the edge of his feet. There just is nothing like being loved, is there? Perhaps that's the greatest human need each of us have. Amen? To be loved. But love is risky, isn't it? Will they love me? Do you love me? Those are two of the riskiest questions we face in life. And in essence, that's exactly what Ruth was risking as she approaches Boaz here. Now there are a few people who want to interpret what happens next in this story as sexual intimacy or sexual manipulation. I personally believe and suggest that we should reject that interpretation. I believe that's reading into the text and not reading from the text. And by the way, I am aware of the occurring euphemism in that time for the word feet to also refer to genitals. But I'm persuaded that simply is not warranted in these verses. And truthfully, it makes no difference either way. I mean, whether they have sexual relations or not. And we do need to remember that this scene that we're reading here in chapter 3 is taking place out in the open. It's not in the privacy of a room or a tent. And the words repeatedly used to describe both Ruth and Boaz speak of their honorable character. So I'm persuaded that's off the table. The key feature in chapter 3 is Ruth seeking a redeemer. And the only other example of a redeemer in the Bible is Jesus Christ. It does not make sense that Ruth would need to use sex to be redeemed because that's not what Jesus needs in order to redeem us. It's off the table. Boaz, it says, awakens with cold feet. Been there. <laughs> and by that, I mean either figuratively or literally, or both. And he realizes the presence of another person by him. And since he does not have a flashlight, and it's dark, he asks, who is there? And Ruth identifies herself as his handmaiden. And then, rather than waiting for Boaz to tell her what to do, which is what Naomi instructed her, Ruth makes this bold move and asks him to spread his wings over her as the family redeemer. Now, if you go home and read this, or if you read this before you came to worship, yes, some translations have her asking him to spread his cloak, or his skirt, or his covering over her. But I'm pointing out to us that in the text, she uses the same word 
that Boaz used when he spoke to her earlier about taking refuge under the shelter of God's wings. So it's clear to him what she is asking for. And he's impressed that she would follow the Israelite law and not chase after some other younger man, but follow for the kinsman redeemer. And so he agrees to her request, but he makes a qualification. Now there is some opinion that a widow needed to ask to be redeemed. And I bring that up, not certain if that's true or not in this case, but identifying that that clearly is how redemption works with us and Jesus Christ. Christ did die for the sins of the whole world. That's true. However, until I personally seek connection with that Redeemer, the sacrifice of that Redeemer is meaningless in my life. Boaz spoke about another kinsman Redeemer who was actually first in line above Boaz. We can only presume that Naomi did not know this. And this might explain why Boaz was maybe less aggressive in his relationship with Ruth than what Naomi was hoping. But Boaz makes this pledge. Ruth will be redeemed. Wow. With the qualification that it just might not be him who redeems her. Then he promises to clear the whole matter up in the morning at the city gate, which was what the tradition dictated according to the laws of Moses. Meanwhile, he sends her home with the most generous gift of grain yet, an assurance that she and Naomi would never glean or be hungry again. And so the chapter ends with Naomi being confident of what will happen and assures Ruth that she can rest and wait in joyful peace. Psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. We're familiar with waiting, aren't we? It's been 2,000 years since the Redeemer came. Yes, we've been redeemed. Jesus, our Redeemer, paid the price for us. And now we have this promise and we're waiting with assurance for the time when he will return and we will receive the glorious end of our redemption. That's coming. And so's the end of the book in chapter 4 next week. Heavenly Father, what awesome news we have. Good news. The gospel truth that we have been redeemed Father, help us live like those kind of people.
Christ's name, amen. In every part of created order, with every person around us, in each circumstance we face, Thank you for joining us. God bless you until we meet again.